Ebene. The uh, 100th birth anniversary of Alan Turing is uh, being celebrated this year all over the world, as you know. He was born on 12 June 1912 and he died on 7 June 1954 at a very tender age of 42. The Alan Turing was a mathematician, engineer, whose landmark and revolutionary contributions laid the foundations of computing and computer science that have had a transformational impact on science, engineering, and society. Computer science is certainly at the basis of the dominant technology of the 20th century. Earlier in the year, in an issue of Nature dedicated to Alan Turing's birth centenary, Sidney Brenner wrote an article titled, Life's Code Script, Turing Machines and Cells Have Much in Common. I think uh, this article is a, is a wonderful article. It's deep and uh, visionary. And uh, we thought we'd invite uh, Professor Brenner for this uh, lecture to commemorate uh, Alan Turing's birth centenary. And uh, as you know, Sidney Brenner is one of past century's leading pioneers in genetics and molecular biology. And for his many contributions, which I will not list over here, uh, he was awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize. And he is presently associated with the Crick Jacobs Center for Theoretical and Computational Biology and the Howard Hughes Medical Center in Washington. DC. Uh, with these very few words, uh, I would now like to invite uh, Obaid Siddiqui, who played no small role in getting Sydney here to Bangalore, uh, a long acquaintance of Sydney, to present a bouquet of flowers, a memento, and say a few words. So, so I, I, I should first, um, uh, see, Sydney was here three years ago at the, to give a lecture at the Institute Centenary, and I was chided after the lecture for t taking too long and, and <laughs> cutting into his time. So I should not do that this time. Uh, in, uh, I will uh, therefore not uh, tell you about uh, all the contributions that he made to biology, they are, some of them are written in the poster, and there are several more which <laughs> one could talk about. <clears throat> I, um, I'd like to, to say a few words about his, uh, his parhim as a person, yes. And, um, and I shouldn't take more than five, three minutes, right? <laughs> so um, he, he was born in South Africa, and he uh, studied medicine, you know, proper medicine in this. And uh, he went to Cambridge to, uh, to did his PhD with Sir Cyril Hinshelwood in physical chemistry. Yes. Beg your pardon? Oh. oh, you, it was in Oxford, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, uh, so Cyril Hinshelwood had, was a remarkable man, but he had some heterodox ideas about uh, genetics and about bacterial adaptation. And, and genetics. After that, Sydney um, spent a couple of years in uh, US, Cold Spring Harbor and Berkeley, and then joined a small group of people uh, in Cambridge at, in, in what was then called the Medical Research uh, MRC uh, unit. The unit was set up uh, primarily first for, by, by crystallographer. Uh, Bragg was its, its head and its first members, Perutz and, and Kendrew, but they, were, they, they brought other people, and among the first people to join them 
was Francis Crick and, uh, and, and Sidney Brenner. And uh, it would not be an exaggeration to say that uh, uh, Crick and Brenner changed the face of MRC, MRC unit uh, in this. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, it was about applying crystallography to, uh, to proteins. And then when DNA was discovered in uh, 1953, that was a year before uh, Alan Turing died. 1954, he died. It was discovered in 53. Uh, after that, uh, MRC lab, and MRC lab was in a small hut of, I think, maybe 8,000 square feet or something like that. Not, not that. And in that hut, there were these uh, six people, but everyone in those days, uh, who was either in America or in Europe, uh, who, who was doing something uh, having to do with uh, genetics and molecular biology came to Cambridge. So all the, the whole world came to Cambridge. It was the epicenter at, at that time. Uh, now, uh, uh, Sidney, uh, after that, he has, uh, you know, he has done many things, and his interests are very... Uh, so one thing I can say about Sydney is that uh, he is not, he does not respect any boundaries and subjects in this. And he also is no, in general, no respecter of boundaries. So he, he lives in uh, five countries or four countries and maybe five, five cities in this. Um, in this. And uh, he has uh, been in India several times. He has been here uh, on a personal note. Uh, he, when we came to Tata Institute and to start some biology in 1962, just about 60 years ago, he took a lot of interest and helped us in many ways. So I, again, welcome him to Indian Institute. Sit. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to be back here again and to give a Turing lecture. And I should begin by telling you about my own connection with uh, Turing. Uh, my college in Cambridge has, got not, has not a very distinguished uh, background. You know, a few minor prime ministers, but very few scientists until the century, uh, the last century. And amongst the fellows of the college uh, is, was a man called Alan Turing. And of course, our other great person was uh, Keynes, who was one of the great founders of uh, economics in the country. But we weren't like Trinity, which had people like Newton and Rutherford, all the physicists that had become that Maxwell. They were all in Trinity. But we had Turing, and I think then that that was uh, one of the interesting things uh, why I felt I would love to come and give a Turing lecture, because I'm a great admirer of Turing. And I have to explain why Turing is very important for for the whole of biology. Now, he wrote a paper in 1952, I think, which was on applying reaction diffusion equations to morphogenesis. He got very interested in how you had a, made a spinal column with 26 vertebrae, and he wondered how you did that counting. And so we worked out a he worked this out, and of course, what he discovered is you can't count very accurately with the system, uh, which actually works by short-range excitation with longer-range inhibition. Then you can generate these wave, spatial waves. 
in inner structure. But he points out in this paper, which is quite interesting to read, that maybe you could get five different things. So why not have any uh, applications uh, on two morphogenesis until quite recently. In fact, most of its, uh, its uh, applications are in physical chemistry because you can actually get systems that compute spatial waves by having a number of chemical processes. But if you enlarge this to the rather general principle of uh, not having a continuous medium, that's another thing because he just did it for a continuous medium, but we know we have all of this got lots of cells in them. So if you then take cellular systems and think of this, uh, then you can begin to see the parallels. So you can explain the stripes on a zebra by something which is a, something like a Turing system. But in fact, what they fail to do, you can't explain the segmentation in Drosophila on a Turing principle, something completely different. So that is one of his contributions. Uh, and of course, it's the one that he thought would have the most direct biological effect. He also wrote another, another paper that appeared in Mind, and uh, I had n everybody has known about this, which was, could you get a computer to simulate a person? In other words, could, could a computer think? Now, people think it's about a computer thinking. And I'll do this because there's quite an interesting question that arises a little later in this talk. But it isn't about that. It's called, could a computer imitate the behavior of a person. So that it's, and the paper is entitled The Imitation Game. It's called an imitation game. So you're allowed to ask, you have a person in a room and you have a computer in a room, you're allowed to ask questions of them. And in fact, you must then ask, how do you distinguish between the two? Many people thought this was a simulation, but it's an imitation, and there's something most decidedly important about it. But the fundamental paper that he wrote is entitled On Computable Numbers. It was written in 1936 and published in 1937, and it is the thing he's most famous for, for inventing what had become the Turing machine. Now, if you go and uh, read this paper again, and you will see that what he was trying to do was to make a system which could mechanically, automatically compute numbers. That is what it could produce. But during this, he disc and what it was, a machine, that had a tape, usually infinite tape, could move it backwards and forwards. It could erase symbols, binary symbols mostly, and could overwrite them and could write symbols on this. And so the machine could then proceed, not only this, but there's a remarkable generalization of this which is known as the universal computer. That is, he was able to prove that you could design, using the same structures, a universal machine, which given the description of any other Turing machine, could perform that computation. In other words, all you needed was the description of the machine, and then the universal machine could do it. Now, of course, that is the discovery of what we now know 
as the programmable computer. That is, the computer has certain elementary functions, and then given a program, as we call it, then the computer can execute that program. And that can then form the basis of all modern computing machinery at the time. Now, a person to whom this is credited is von Neumann. But von Neumann didn't intervent, invent the universal machine. He actually invented an, an, a, an implementation of it, which he then could define. And uh, it's known today as the von Neumann machine. But it really is a Turing machine in these forms. Now, von Neumann was a very interesting uh, person. And of course, uh, he also realized, and he began to speculate, uh, what could you do in this? Uh, and so he became very inter interested in the following question. Could you do something more interesting than just make numbers. Could you use these principles to build machines? Suppose you had a machine that you could put in a sea of components, infinite number of components. You didn't have to make everything. Could this machine begin to construct? Could there be a universal constructor just like there is a universal constructor, a, a universal Turing machine, could there be a universal construction machine? And that led him directly, he began to realize very quickly that that led him directly to be able to formulate the self-reproducing machine. So let's just see what a machine needs. It needs a tape, it needs a set of instructions that says this is the way you build a machine of this type. Right? And therefore, that can be done. So it can pick in the sea of components and assemble a copy of itself as a machine. But in order that you can make it self-reproducing, you have to perform one last operation. And the last operation is to copy the description of the machine and insert it into the new machines. Because they then, in turn, can read the description of themselves and produce other machines which can continue to reproduce. If you didn't put the tape in, there would be no reproduction of the machine. So he realized this, and uh, he wrote a paper which had very little impact in biology at all. Wrote a paper, and it had circulated in various ways. But the first publication appears in a book, which is the report of the Hickson Symposium at Caltech, uh, in 1951, so this precedes DNA. And there he describes the logic of self-reproducing machines. Now, why is that important? Because previous to this, Schrodinger, another physicist, the great theoretical physicist, also had a go at trying to look at the biological side. And so he was asking about the genes, he called them chromosomes, never mind the, the difference in the language. And he said that the chromosomes contain a plan for the construction of the organism, that is, they contain the developmental plan. But he said they also contain the means of execution. They do not contain the means of execution, they contain a description 
of the means of execution. He fused the two together and he has a statement, it is both architect and builder at the same time. In other words, it's not. It's an architect, yes, got the plan. It's encoded there. So, in fact, that, when you came and asked, well, show me implementations of a Turing machine, we could take anybody to a computer, and if you ask, what is an implementation, a real-world implementation of a universal construction machine, it's essentially biology. Biology has that form. And so, the most important general principle of biology, which makes it different from all other things in all other natural systems, is that it is the only system in nature which contains an internal description of itself in the form of this internal description, in the form, of course, as we know now, in the form of DNA. Right? That makes it different. And as I was telling some people before, I went to an extremely long lecture by a Buddhist priest in Japan, and at the end of it, someone in the audience asked him, what is the Buddhist definition of life? And he replied, he said, well, some Buddhists think everything's alive. Rivers are alive, mountains are alive. And I stopped him with the word mountain, and he said, I said, mountains are not alive. He said, how do you know? He said, you can't clone a mountain. You can't take a mountain and clone the information. And clone any other living thing. We can get the description direct. And so I believe the central issues in biology that we biologists face is in fact the decoding, if you like, of this information on the code script. That's what our job is. Our job is to find out how this information here gets produced and produces flies, produces people, different code scripts, produce all kinds of different things and at different levels of complexity. And in fact, I think that that is what makes biology different from, from all other natural sciences, if I can call them that. And that's very important. But what I think you will see is that we introduced, this whole thing introduces a completely new currency, if you like, into the discussion of natural systems. Because we've known about nat matter and energy as being very important in both the natural physical world and in biology, and of course, biological systems must obey the laws of physics. Uh, they are totally relevant, and it's obvious that they will do this. So problems like how do, how do uh, biological systems outwit, you know, thermodynamics, uh, that, that is now not a problem anymore. You, Schrodinger thought it was a problem, because he said, it's, it's, well, you, you know, how can you have a system in which order is maintained and, in fact, if it evolves, order is increased? It's not a system. It just costs a lot of money to do this. It costs a lot of work in order to do this. But, you see, information, I think, is the revolution produced by the concept of DNA. And if you ask what its physical embodiment is, it is in a sequence of bases, right? And I think that's the big fundamental revolution in biology happened with the 
Watson Crick structure. After that, it became obvious what you had to do. And I know I saw it in 1952. I went from Oxford, 1953, before it was published. I went from Oxford to Cambridge to see the model, and it was a revelation. I'm, everything became obvious then, and we just had to get to work. So I think that given that, those are the real fundamental questions that we have to ask. Now, of course, uh, you will now find that we now have a, uh, lots and lots of complicated things inside a living organism. Uh, we have a lot of functions inside it, and the question is, how are we to cope with this enormous complexity? Uh, we can't look at statistical behavior. We don't have that power. We don't have to, it's irrelevant. We have to look in a lot of detail in the complexity. So we have to have a way of understanding complexity. Right? And I chose as my title the architecture of biological complexity and based it on a very profound article written by Simon many years ago, which he called the architecture of complexity. And he gave one example, which I think is very interesting. He says, suppose there's a watchmaker who's building watches. Now, watches are a complicated thing. And let us suppose that there are two ways of doing this. And the one way is that until the last component is added, the watch hasn't got a stable structure or function. And if we suppose that he has a lot of clients and they keep on telephoning him, to answer the telephone he has to drop the watch that he's building. And of course, that would ruin it. So in fact, you can show that above a certain level of complexity, he, he never builds a watch. But suppose he does it in a different way, that he builds it in 10 different components and each one contains one-tenth of the objects. That is, he makes modules in this. Then, in fact, if someone interrupts him, it's only one module that suffers. And so he's the one who has a very efficient way of building watches. And that's a principle that you will find completely available, uh, completely employed at all levels in biology, which is to cluster it, to put in parts. Now, of course, there are many ways you can look at a biological system. And of course, what you want to know is how can we, how can we approach this and deal with it? So I want to give you one general law. I mean, it's Brenner's first law. And you'll find this very useful. Complexity is treated by the objects themselves like income tax. As you know, if you evade income tax, evade paying your income tax, you can go to prison. But they're legal means of avoiding it. Okay? And what you'll find is all kinds of tricks have been used to avoid all the problems of income tax, of the, all the problems that are, arise with complexity. So although people say, look, it's impossible to describe a cell with, we'd need thousands of partial differential equations if we were going to take that model, the answer is you can be certain that if you find it impossible, biological systems will have found a solution that doesn't involve this. Right? And so the big thing is to look. When things look pretty impossible and would involve lots of mathematics, look carefully that they avoid the problems by doing something else. Modularization 
is a very important way of doing it. Right? Now, I said a few minutes ago that our problem in biology, which, which is the problem of how do we take the script, this language written in a one-dimensional language uh, of DNA sequences, we have to transcribe that into various things. So we can ask ourselves, could we describe mathematical equations in DNA? Right? And can I describe a mathematical statement in DNA? And the answer is yes, I can. I can describe a concentration in DNA by building an enzyme who has an, a, an association constant of such and such a value in its, in, its, uh, in its structure, which of course means that it's a very complicated trans, translation from the sequence of amino acid, from the sequence of nucleotide to the sequence of the folded uh, the folded uh, enzyme, the amino acid sequence to the folding of this, which gives me a site that has that property. So the implementation is quite complicated. And it's there in detail. And so we can be sure that if we go to more complicated things, there will be, there will be ways of implementing them by avoiding all the problems that we think we find. So in a sense, I think what biology is moving to is yet another problem, which is, you might say, it is organization. How is the thing organized inside the biological system? What value does this organization have? So, well, let me give you a few examples of, of the tricks that can play. So, I, I asked myself, as indeed what many people have been asking is, could we, the plan is this, is to take the sequence of DNA and to annotate it. This is the thing. So they'll write the sequence of DNA and they'll say, well, this is a gene with a, makes a protein which has this enzyme. So there will be, as you think, which would happen, an annotation which would then accompany this, would give you a richer picture of the thing. And of course, uh, it doesn't. It still renders it opaque. And I'll show in a moment why that is why that is the case. Now, suppose I am told that basically uh, here is a system, it's got this written on the DNA. You notice I've you said the word, I've said the word uh, description. I haven't said the word that it's a program because we're accustomed to writing programs in the imperative. We say do, we say add, we give instructions in our programs, we instruct the machine. And that is exactly the wrong analog to think about. So let me give you how the way I think we have to classify machines in general, whether they are, so that you can see what kind of computation mechanism it is. So I'm going to define two machines, and their function is to compute uh, mathematical functions. So I can go to both machines and say factorial files. Right? And both machines will reply 120. Right? Now, we take the first machine and we remove the front and we look in the inside. How does it work? And we see that there is inside this machine a program 
that when you write factorial 5, what it does is it says activate a program which is written there called the factorial program, which you can then specify uh, either iteratively or in any other form, and it will calculate the actual product. So it'll say it's actually will take five and multiply it by four, take the product, multiply it down. Anybody can do it. So let's call that a P machine. Now I've got another machine. This machine says don't have to we don't calculate anything. We go to a table in the machine and it says go to table marked factorial and tell me what the fifth entry is. And the fifth entry will be 120. Okay. Now, those are the things that many of us who started science before there were computers uh, actually had tables of logarithms. You had to have your log table. I still have mine. And if you were asked what is the logarithm of uh, this, you didn't have a computer to calculate it. You looked it up in the table. So you can ask yourself, how were those tables made? Those tables were made by any means possible. The tables were constructed, tables of Bessel functions, uh, trigonometric tables, by hand calculation, by mechanical cal calculation, by abacus, by any means possible. And then they were entered, and you never had to do the calculation again. All right? You just looked it up. Now that's marvelous because it means that you get the answer with one lookup function. Whereas the others, the bigger the number, if we ask for factorial 100, the program would take a long time to execute. But of course, if we ask for the tables of factorial functions, it takes a lot of space to store them. Now, it is, if you like, just a fact in the history of computers that storage was extremely expensive and that random access storage was extremely expensive and therefore you had to minimize it. You had to actually just use the space to do the calculation, give the answer, and then fill the space, whatever was available with others. But on the other hand, storage space in, in the biological system is very cheap. It's just DNA. So you must look upon us as tea machines. The tables have been calculated by evolution, by trial and error, in fact. And all we do is look up the answers. We look up, we just look it up, and it tells us what are the parameters we must use. And if we implement those, we're all right. And that's because space, DNA, is, can store information incredibly uh, at a much higher density than anything else. Of course, you need a complicated machine to do this. So what you have to think about is that the constraints of the way computing machines went in the, in the world of computers went completely differently. Now, of course, things are changing because storage space is becoming very cheap. With integrated circuit space, I mean, you can buy, you know, you can buy Half a half a giga, uh, half a giga uh, byte of storage space, very cheaply, a few a few pounds. You know, you can just buy it now. So in fact, many people are pre-computing their values instead of trying to do fast Fourier applications. You just calculate them and then you just look them up. In other words. 
don't have to have special algorithms to do these things. Just do it, store it as a table, and just look up the answer. And I suggest that when time is becoming now the condensing thing that you have to do in the natural computers, we'll try and do most of this once, keep the answer, never have to do it again. And you just look up the answer. So, I think that these two machines, and of course we don't have a table machine for computing because part of the action is the execution of the computation, which we do over and over again every time we need it because space was so hard and expensive. So I think this is the big difference between the two machines. So now let us just give you some examples about complexity. Complexity is the following. I'm told, you're told, by someone who's looked at the genome of any complex animal like ourselves and sees that it codes for 20,000 different proteins. Right? And he wants to know, how am I going to deal with this? So he also knows that these proteins are going to interact with, with anything, with themselves and so on. So he draws a matrix. 20,000 by 20,000, you have 400 million entries. That's a very big matrix. And he has to know what is the value at each point. And the point is that if you did this to biology and looked at it, it isn't like a gas where you would like to do this kind of Laplacian calculation and know every point. Don't, most of the things are zero. Most of, the, most of the occupancy is zero. What you will find, so there are sparse matrices which means there's strong interactions, strong clustering inside this matrix of certain of the objects. And that's what you need. That's another way of saying there are little modules in this. So strong clustering. So how does this, I want to have a general description of how a cell works, and so I'd like to fill in my partial differential equations, all the parameters, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you couldn't do it anyway, and if E. coli tried to do it, or your cell tried to do it, it would just make a mess of the thing. In fact, if you tried to do it in this way, it would just be noise. It would just be noise. So what is interesting then is non-sparse matrices in this description. And let's look at them. So we look in this and we say, well, 20,000 proteins in a cell. And what I see is no protein, very rarely does a protein act on its own. And in fact, these proteins are bound together in, uh, in organized aggregates, that is in organized structures which we will call devices. And in fact, on average, there is a device uh, would have, just allow me to say, a reasonable number is 10. It just happens it makes the sums easier. But some things are very, are very complicated. So in fact, the machinery that cuts out the parts of a gene that uh, it's called the splicing machinery, then is the product of 65 different proteins, at least. Probably also some nucleic acid molecules. Right? So you have to consider that as a big aggregate, 65. The, p the machinery that allows you to start translating a DNA, an RNA into protein contains 26 products of 26 different genes which are grouped together 
in, in, a, in a very defined way. So it is this level that tells you that's really great because what this can do is then reduce the complexity immediately. So instead of dealing with 20,000 proteins, we're dealing with 2,000 gadgets, devices, molecular devices. And we can go to them and we can solve each one in turn by the classical methods of doing the structure, looking at the interactions, and then we can have to that device, we can ascribe a function. And these functions could be, the output is if you have this device and it's sitting on a messenger RNA, it will lead to the initiation of protein synthesis. Right? Or it's part of the replication machinery. And that means that we've reduced then the matrix is now very sparse. Now, but we also find that the cell isn't homogeneous. It's not the same everywhere. You have different components of it. The membrane of the cell is different from the inside. And you have organelles like mitochondria inside cells, which are different. And if you say, I've got 10 compartments, then you've taken these devices and you've put them in different compartments. So in each compartment, we now have a tangible way of really studying the interaction. Because we're now only speaking of a few hundred, right? And that's within our compass to actually formulate exactly. So given that this is the case, we can then solve the complexity problem and we can go to higher levels at this. For example, you want to know how brain works? Uh, the most important discovery in the brain is that it's built of cells called neurons and that they have special connections with each other. It isn't that every cell is potentially joined to every other cell. People thought this was the case. There was a hypothesis of the brain. It was called the reticular hypothesis. But the big breakthrough was a neuron hypothesis, which is, of course, a hundred, just over 100 years old. And I think that is there is there are units. And, of course, these are, again, clustered in various things which are different, like the piece of the brain that is that detects all the visual sy system that is produced in one place. You can consider the retina as a unit and, and you can then proceed to study this thing without worrying about all the kinds of connections that may or may not be there. So this breaking up of things into the pieces is, I think, one of the most important ways of finding legal avoidance from paying the complexity tax. You can avoid it. And there are many other examples which haven't gone, which we needn't go into for this. So I've uh, written a paper on this. Uh, it is only seems to have been read by cranks who write to me and say, it was a marvelous paper, let me tell you my theory. And so, uh, but I think it's, it's interesting because I've got a very good analogy for this. So let's say you want to understand how a city works. Bangalore doesn't matter what city. And so you go to a city, you can get hold of the telephone directory. It's got a list of all the people there and their addresses. Okay. The white pages of a telephone directory is the genome sequence of the city. It doesn't tell you very much more than there are people there. Right? Now, what do we want to know next? Well, people say, well, let's annotate the white pages. They're called the yellow pages. You see? And people will say, Wow, you know, 
there are plumbers in the city. That means there have to be pipes somewhere, because we know that plumbers plumb pipes. So we can deduce from that property, that annotation, that there has to be a piping system. And we hope that by going deeper into this, we'll be able to find it. All right? And then we'll have deeper and deeper annotations of this, and we'll try to understand the entire system. But you know yourself what determines the structure of a city. There are units called homes, flats, houses, where families live. And every morning, these decompose, disaggregate. They then move, travel, to a whole set of other units called schools, banks, hospitals, whatever you want to do it, where they aggregate into other structures. Right? And that, has the fun that is the function of the city. It's part of that. And that is why when we think of this, we think of how to analyze a city is the same as analyzing the cell. We must make a map of this at, at these increasingly higher levels. So, for example, the professor who bumps into his bank manager in the subway, that's a collision that has no significance. What's significant is if his bank manager calls the professor to his office in the bank. That's a significant interaction. Okay? And so we must be able to classify all of this. So I have written this. It's called Cell Map. It is how to make a map of all these interactions at the various levels. But of course, nobody wants to implement it at all. And I think that this is sad because I think that's the big challenge. Big challenge in biology, which has now become, in the eyes of many, data driven, a data driven science. You see, but what is, we, what is the problem about this? We aren't just drowning in a sea of data and thirsting for knowledge. That's what we are. That's a great statement. Thirsting for knowledge in the sea of data. So the organization of this data is, becomes the imperative, imperative task we have to do with modern biology or it will, it will never be understood. And in fact, to understand it requires that. Now, you cannot, you cannot organize data just to do this in that way. I mean, there are many people who say, oh, we're going to do a lot of data mining. And as some of you know, I have a new definition of data mining. It's as follows. It says, what's my data is mine, and what's your data is also mine. <laughs> and, and I think that you don't get it this way. So we actually have to have a, we actually have to have a theoretical framework of to how we need to embed this, and you can sketch this out, and it all and all data, all data has to obey what I call the CAP principle. CAP stands for complete, accurate, permanent. You never have to do it again. So it can go in there as a permanent statement. And if you look at all the data being accumulated in biology, it is incomplete, a lot of it is inaccurate, and for sure it's going to be temporary. We're going to have to get rid of this and start again. So you only know what to get if you've got a theoretical framework to embed the scene. And that's what I think biologists need to do because we did introduce a new concept into the natural sciences, which is information that I've mentioned here, sparse matrices, that they are communication systems. 
They're not yeah. instructional systems, which many people think. The genes don't tell you what to do. They don't say, make a hand. I mean, you know. And in fact, there was a very famous uh, paper once written who compared the genetic program, as James Bonner wrote this. So we had a program which said, uh, that the program, and he wrote it in sort of uh, pigeon fortran, and it said, make a hand. And it stated as follows, for n equal, for n one to five, make finger, make finger n. In other words, make five fingers, then you've got a hand. And of course, there's nothing of the sort. I mean, you can't imagine this. So what the best way, I think, to think about it is to say we have things which emit messages. The messages get to their targets. Yeah, the targets then can transform them and emit other messages. So that they are communication systems. And they can be represented as this. So the whole law, for example, enzymatic biochemistry can be put. The substrate is the message this unit receives, right? And the product is what carries it on. And if you say, well, is there a pathway map in the cell that would look, say, like the London Underground or if you want one that's even more complicated, look at the Tokyo subway. Can you say this? And it doesn't work that way because you only know where to go when you've reached the next station. Okay? That is because that's a communication. So you buy a ticket in this analogy that takes you from A to B. When you get to B, you now have a product of getting to B, and that buys you the next ticket. So there's no explicit map in the cell. That wiring, that sort of uh, subway plan is a construction we've imposed on it. It doesn't work that way. There is no plan that, in fact, all that is is that you go from this step to that step, you get to the next step, you get you get the next message, and you know what to do. So I think, and that is the only way, by the way, with, because there's a very difficult problem that follows on this. It's the only way that you can understand the evolution of complexity. You cannot make, like the, blind, the watchmaker, you cannot make complicated machines by design uh, from the start. You have to make simpler things and join them together. And in fact, the whole of the evolution of complex multicellularity, cellularity, specialization, which you find in us leading right up to this elaborate machine we call the brain, these have all evolved yet. They haven't been reinvented. And I think that if we were to understand that framework, that's what is essential in biology. So at the uh, end of this talk, I have to return to Turing. See, as many people have not realized that the profound, the profound idea which came about absolutely coincidentally. Because you could, if you were a historian of science and you read von Neumann's paper, you would say that that is where Watson and Crick got the idea of a chemical program. They had nothing to do with this. They didn't think about it this way. So it's a paradox that von Neumann's application of Turing's ideas to a construction machine have absolutely no influence on biology. It is only we looking in retrospect can see, yes, that's the big fundamental difference. 
And if you were to ask again, and with the statement I started with, why is biology different from geology or physics or any of the other sciences? It is the only part of the natural world which has an internal description of the objects there. And I think that given that, the task of the biologist becomes very clear. And our job is to look as to how this description came about, the evolutionary problem, uh, what it builds, the construction problem, and how function is represented in it. And therefore, if you were to ask me, what, what am I? You know, am I a systems biologist or a molecular biologist? I say, no, I am a biologist. I think that's what we all are. And in fact, Turing was a bit of a biologist, but when he thought he was a good biologist, he was wrong. Okay? He was a very good biologist when he invented the Turing machine. Thank you very much. Sydney, thank you for a truly brilliant talk. Very inspiring. Uh, will you take a few questions? Sure. Okay. I'll even take a few answers. <laughs> <laughs> you just raise your hand, and if I can see you, yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm Dr. Shetty, I'm a medical doctor. Okay, you mentioned about uh, biological complexities uh, uh, by genes and DNA coding. And uh, how do you explain uh, some of the functions like uh, consciousness and uh, confidence and all those uh, biological functions? Right. See, I think consciousness will never be solved. But it will disappear as a problem. It'll disappear, and in 25, 50 years' time, people look back on all these discussions and say, what were they talking about? <laughs> I'll tell you a problem that did disappear. This is called embry embryological determination. And people argued in the 50s and the 60s, what is the difference between determination and differentiation? And this discussion is meaningless now to most modern students of biology. They don't even know what people were worried about. So I think we have to be careful. It is in the, in the way science proceeds. The problems get reformulated in a completely different way, sometimes using a different language, and therefore what you think is an intractable problem today, and how do we account for it? That just becomes a meaningless question, I think, in the future. So, I mean, a year ago, the new scientist asked various people, what about consciousness? And there were only two answers. One was mine saying, it's not a problem and will surely disappear. It will never be solved. And the other was Terry Zhanovsky, who's a computational neuroscientist. He also thinks that it's just an incorrectly formulated question. It's, it's, it hasn't been formulated in a way that you ha can have a biological explanation in, with the present parlance. They have to be formulated in a different way. Uh, in information theory or th systematic theory of information uh, predates discovery of DNA and is due to Claude Shannon. If you think about graph theory itself, that's early 1700s. Euler wrote a paper in 1730-something. Yeah. So can you elaborate more on your comment that well, biology yes, brought I information? I think, you see, there is a confusion. Uh, Shannon 
uh, Shannon uh, had the idea of, which was a communication theory, had the idea of information. And that idea of information is in fact, you could actually assign it to, you could actually show the equivalence of that with entropy. Now, we do not deal with information in that sense. So there were many papers written post-Shannon to try and ask, ask questions like, what is the information content of DNA? And would we say, we say we use information much more, not in that technical sense, because it's just inter-symbol correlation, okay? just decreases how much information you need to send so you can reconstruct or interpret the message. We use information in the sense that you say, I read the newspaper to get information. So the word message is much more important than general information. It's meaningless to ask what, how much information is there in DNA and I'm sure every undergraduate would say, a lot. <laughs> Incidentally, I was on a group many years ago. Uh, I served on the committee. It was organized by Donald Mickey, who actually were there to bring Turing back to life again. We had his biography written. But during the course of this, we collected a lot of material. And it isn't known, but Turing met Shannon when the British government in 19, during the war, it was in 1941 or 42, they sent a delegation to America so that they could collaborate on various projects. Okay? And amongst these, projects they collaborated on, and the British government gave the Americans the penicillin that they had just found. Of course, the Americans then produced it. But amongst the things was radar, and there is a record that Shannon and Turing had a conversation. There is a record of it. It's in the book. And it, it was interesting to try and find out what they talked about. But apparently, someone did make some notes, and it was just very general. It didn't concern Turing machines at all. Uh, and I think that that was very important. Another component of this was uh, Shannon's, Shannon's work. Sir, uh, I'm a student of astrobiology, and uh, the point I was trying to know is these building blocks for life exists elsewhere in the universe, not only on Earth. But if that is so, when and how did the Earth give rise to as complex uh, biological processes as the human beings or the human brain? How did it happen and when did it happen? And what process led uh, this evolution uh, to, to become human beings? This is what I thought. Well, yes. Uh, you can say, you see, that uh, you know, uh, many, many, many cosmologists have reflected on this question of what you need in order that you could generate something like a human being. And of course, they've asked the questions, what happens if the physical constants had been changed and that carbon was trivalent rather than tetravalent. My answer is very, very simple. We can only deal with what we have here. You can speculate that in principle it might have happened. Would it have used the same machinery? We don't know. But when you say that you need these physical constants, the constants as they are, you know, the, the various products of these that have been calculated as the fundamental constants. And what happened if they've been modified just a little bit? Would, would it still be the same? My answer is, well, 
If carbon were t trivalent, we would have called it nitrogen. <laughs> so it means that we can only take what's here and what has reached a form of stability and see, and people have tried to calculate what is the probability. So, rare events, when you have the product of very rare events, with a very large number of events, it's possible. But whether it would be the same, I don't know. It is said that a student was once asked, it said that it gave him an exam question. It said, you've just landed on Mars. How would you go about determining if life existed? And a lot of these guys started to say, well, they would do this, they would look for these elements, they set up experiments. But the student who was the right one gave a two-word answer. He said, I'd ask. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite interesting, because you may find that that's the best way of getting the information, is, is if there are other sentient beings. But I think the... <laughs> The interesting question is that one, and you know, astrobiology, we don't know. We just don't know what the probability is, why it happened here. We know the various steps. We know what was required. We know we had to, we had to have, we had to enrich the oxygen on the surface, and they had to have a certain temperature. And the only way you can learn about this is to find organisms that still live at what you think is the conditions of the primitive Earth, which we think is probably very high sulfur. I think sulfur took the role of oxygen at the beginning, so, and very hot. So it really smelt bad, the Earth, if you try to approach it let us say, two or three billion years ago, and all these things were living in boiling water. They still live in boiling water today. So, there you are. Hello. Here. So, here, here. So, in this complex machine, so how do you account for the automatic disappearance so I'm referring to the aging and death of an organism. Sorry, say again? So in this complex, in your analogy of biological complexity to a machine, so how do you account for automatic disappearance? So, I am, so what I mean by automatic disappearance is death and aging. Aging? Yeah. Death and aging. Death, ah. death and aging. Well, all machines age. They just get worn out. And different machines age in different rates. Then anybody who's built machines know that they get worn out. Sometimes they get worn out catastrophically. Okay? Something, something burns out. You have to replace the part, which is, of course, hard to do if this happens to you. So I think all of those, and of course, if these are processes that effectively we think is the most important thing is that we collect errors. We collect mistakes. Right? And this is the change of our... And sometimes these errors can be amplified. So we can account for this. So for example, uh, if, you, if you like, uh, many people want to say talk about Alzheimer's disease, and they want to say, why has it become so prevalent? The point is that a lot of people died before they could get Alzheimer's disease. So if you want to decrease Alzheimer's disease, the best thing medical science could do is say, increase, increase heart disease. <laughs> Just kill the people before they get it. And I think that's the more interesting, it's an interesting thing because the machine wears out. 
And I think that that's interesting to consider this. And what is amusing is that it differs in different people's abroad distribution. And whether you've had a bad life that has led you to various excesses, uh, it is said that, that organic chemists had a much lower, uh, a lower life expectancy than the others because, of course, they were there inhaling chemicals uh, all the time and, of course, accumulating more DNA damage. So I think that that's, uh, that's the, important, the important thing. And let me just make one other point, uh, which I think is interesting. If you compare complex things that we build, let us say any piece of machinery, telephone, any piece of machinery that we build, we build it for durability. Physical devices are built so they can use over and over again. But biological machines, if you like, are not built for durability because actually, you know, if you don't have it, you can throw it away and just make another copy of it. So they built then what is, what is, what is the continuous presence is, of course, the information how to build a machine, not the machine itself. You can do this. So if you're going to try and build machines using biological principles, we would not be interested in, you know, building it so it doesn't uh, wear out or anything like that. Because, okay, we accept it wears out, we can just make some more of it. So that's a very big difference between biological machines and physical machines such as we build. So, do you imply that there is no program in the beginning? Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Uh, when it comes to the uh, yeah. internal descriptions of the biological system, I feel uh, it need not to be different from physical system. That is one, the universe has a single content. When if we understand the structure of the space-time properly and harmonize with the fundamental forces, it need not to be the internal description of the biological system may be different from the and also the consciousness what initially he asked so these all things the fundamental forces and the structure of the space time once if it reveals properly completely so even we might be having the same internal description for the universe in the future dimension as well as the back in the space time dimensions thank you Okay, that's a statement, not a question. <laughs> so, it was a, a story, and this uh, is a true story about okay. Dirac, who was a very famous physicist. He went yeah. to give a lecture in America, and at the end, the chairman... Uh, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, just, just a minute. Yeah. And at the end, the chairman said, well, Dr. Dirac, will you answer a few questions and somebody got up and he said I don't understand how you did this from this point to this point and uh, Dirac just sat there he was a man of very few words anyway and he sat there and the chairman got very embarrassed he said would you answer that question he says that wasn't a question that was a statement <laughs> <laughs> sorry that's a I think uh, what is the question uh, there's a, we'll take just one last question uh, yeah uh, yeah going by the premise that uh, too much of data generation is detrimental without a proper theoretical backup so uh, coming from the field of systems neuroscience a lot of theory uh, is modeled on the assumption that biological systems are optimal what are your views on assuming biological systems to be optimal systems? They're not optimal systems. They're satisfactory systems. <laughs> See, mathematics is the art of the perfect. 
physics is the art of the optimal, but biology is only the art of it works, it's, it's satisfactory. That's all it is. You can't, you, can't, you can't make it optimal in the sense that given a choice of a number of ways of doing it, this is least saving for energy and time and all the other constraints that you have to bound to optimality. Your job is to continue, you see? So, uh, you know, and uh, your job is not to do things optimally, but to actually have a satisfactory solution. That is not detrimental. So if you like, it's like the story of the three bears. It is that it's not too small, it's not too big, it's just right. <laughs> yeah, so I think that is it. A satisfactory solution, because if it's not satisfactory, you'll be eliminated. Capital punishment is very, very, very strong in biology, biological system. Sir, uh, I have one last question. I think, uh, no. I think we just uh, stop the questions, please, and let's thank uh, Sydney for this uh, extraordinary talk. Thank you.